This is JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals. I'm Dean Perrine, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, welcome to our monthly virtual CEO roundtable. We're bringing together top industry experts talking about topics important to our industry in our monthly series, available right here on JSA's YouTube channel and on JSA Radio, the only tech and telecom podcast on iHeartRadio. These monthly roundtables lead us up to our on-site CEO roundtables at our industry networking events, the Telecom Exchange. Our next Telecom Exchange is due here on June 20th and 21st in New York City. If you'd like to learn more about the Telecom Exchange, Exchange you can go to thetelecomexchange.com. Today's roundtable is brought to you on our JSA video platform, which allows our panelists to log in virtually from anywhere, care of our friends at Pinnaca. Okay, we've got a fun, fun show for you today. We are talking technology and the environment, the future of sustainability, and I'm honored to introduce our guest moderator, Mr. Michael Goodenough. Michael is the Digital Transformation Officer of WOA.com. That's W-H-O-A.com. Michael is the catalyst for digital innovation and technological transformation within the company. He is also the co-founder and VCTO of the Cognitive, the Cognitive Consortium, a well-known cloud visionary. Uh, Michael, designed, Michael designed the consortium to provide market research expertise around the integration of networks, cloud computing, and big data. Michael, thank you very much for joining us today. Would you please do us the honors of introducing the subject matter and our expert panelists? Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Dean. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. You know, um, uh, throughout our course of history and working and, and personal history and, and the avenues that we end up taking, we're really oftentimes caught asking ourselves, what are we doing to make a change? You know, what are we doing to really help impact uh, the future? And, and at WOE, we focus very much on cybersecurity and protecting that, that individual entity that's out there and the corporations that are out there and focusing on threat prevention and threat detection. And uh, we really get caught in asking that question often. And we find amazing people like the panel that we have today and, and organizations that we have today. And, and so uh, today we have a, a group of people who are not only um, looking towards the future of that sustainability for our kids and our children's children, but they're actually taking the action and being a part of major, major innovations and change. So we're really lucky and I'm honored and I, I personally just want to reach out and say thank you to all, for all you folks for being here today. It's a real special thing for me. Um, and uh, we have with us uh, Don Rizzidi, who's the chief creator and, and head of strategy at the Cognitive Consortium. Uh, the Cognitive Consortium is working on some amazing projects that start all the way out endpoint in Mars and coming back. Um, and then as we come back more to our nucleus and the Earth and uh, a lot of the work that's being done with Zachary D'Amato. And Zachary is with a company called NIWA. They're at GetNIWA.com and they're an organization that is looking at the sustainability uh, with hydroponic growth and their water conservations of hundreds of gallons to one. Uh, and really giving us that ability to, to look towards a future. Um, and we also have with us Ken Owens, who is with Cisco, and, and he has a, been a thought leader in this industry for quite some, some time. He's innovated things like virtual data center as a whole and, and is now moving on through the Cisco world as a, as a CTO over in that space, focused on the cloud side of it. And, and I'll let him deal with his introductions. But I really just wanted to say to all of you, you are the change makers. You are the future makers doing it, and I appreciate it extensively. Um, and so with that, why don't we take uh, a moment and let Dawn, would you uh, love like to do an introduction for a minute? And, and you know, I, realistically, um, you are focused very specifically on some projects that are literally out of this world. So why don't you go ahead and let us know a little bit of the fun things that you've been working on? Thanks, Mike. Um, a little about my background. I know I'm coming from marketing and analytics. Um, I got into the IT industry in around 2004, and I came in as a pricing analyst, and I just like using data to solve problems. Um, and that's what led me to what we're doing today with the Cognitive Consortium and to what we're doing today with the Mars Project. Um, my latest collaboration right now, uh, we're working with the, the company in DC called Dobis. And what they do 
they consult and manage global businesses and governments actually by leveraging the power of outer space. Uh, we currently work, we're working on a product and a project that's going to do space-based manufacturing. Um, we're bringing 3D printers to outer space so we can do not only space-based manufacturing, but actually print pods that people can live in when they arrive in outer space. Um, and we're using some great materials and it's a really exciting project because we get to use the applied sciences that we're all involved in right now, which is IT and science <laughs> on the engineering side with the space program um, to just really innovate things that we're using today, like uh, sensor technologies and things like that. That's awesome. That, that's just absolutely astounding. So you're doing the things that we dreamed of as kids, right? I mean, we <laughs> sat back and heard about traveling to the moon and you're actually creating um, space-based manufacturing. That's just absolutely fabulous. It's, 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 it's astounding. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think that, that a lot of people are afraid of the technology. They're, they're afraid of what technology innovation is going to do. Um, and if they're able to hear stories of, of what comes to us from Zach and Zach, I'd love to hear some of the stories that you're doing with the improvement of our waterways in Chicago and, and some of your floating gardens and um, hear about what you're doing with NIWA because what we do here on Earth is the number one focus, how we protect this planet right now. And so would you like to talk just a little bit of how that and it's IOT, right? It, it really is a connected device touching the internet, giving data, again, through the analytics and the importance of this technology and use of this data. So would you just kind of step us through a little bit of what you guys are doing and, and how that's really affecting us? And I know it's been in the news and you've been wildly successful recently, so congratulations too. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, so my background is in food and technology. Uh, I took a little detour in the kitchen and distribution, but then uh, I came back full circle in my career to really focus on how does technology in fact and uh, in fact, impact the environment in different ways. So with NIWA, we're using IoT and smart software and hardware to enable people to learn how to grow for themselves. Uh, we've, we'll be putting a system in 50 different countries, and what that does is that we're able to learn about the different uh, indigenous crops around the world and how they can conserve water and how they can use a mobile phone to grow for their families uh, everywhere from Ukraine to Chile uh, to, to Chicago. So that, that's really exciting because we got to expand uh, what we know and use data and IoT to, to push that envelope even further. On, on the, another note, we're, I'm part of, a, a, a part of Urban Rivers, which is a nonprofit here in Chicago, putting artificial wetlands in the Chicago River, which is just basically floating gardens, but we're actually going to start testing uh, what open water hydroponics really means on an IoT stand. So we're putting sensors to test the water quality the contaminant levels, uh, what, are the, what are the plants uptaking? And then one of my dreams next spring is to actually test the edibles and uh, what open water hydroponics, but that has nothing to do with IoT. However, the data that we derive on the indoor and on the outdoor agricultural sense is allow us to, to learn more of what it can be moving forward in the future and, and how innovative it really can be. And so it's really exciting because that allows us to um, understand areas that we didn't really know much about, you know, say 10 years ago yeah and, and and so you know from the layman's perspective right the, the reality is is you're giving the average homeowner the ability to grow a crop that's indigenous to any other country or any other ecosystem than their own and you're actually giving them the ability to have a green thumb which that's 40 years worth of of tribal knowledge to a farmer that's been working those fields and so the you formed a community around that to yeah. take that knowledge and to take that information and share it. And you said across 50 countries um, within your launch. That's absolutely astounding. I mean, that's amazing. That's it's it's amazing. And with that comes water conservation. And with that comes the ability to not ruin crops or 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 whatnot and and so forth. So, I mean, again, it's it's a, such a commendable value. And then we have Ken Owens, of course, and. Ken being the top tier of Cisco's food chain, Ken, you, you're experiencing some of the most amazing projects and, and innovations that are coming out right now. Um, why don't you step us through just a little bit of, of how that IoT and, and how that community is really um, thriving, uh, uh, especially under a lot of the, the, the value that Cisco brings and a lot of the, the consumers, whether it be partners or whether it be actual customers. 
Um, loving the work that you're doing in that space too. But yeah, fill us in. Yeah, definitely, Mike. Thank, thanks for having me. It's great to be on, a, on this panel with Dean and, and Don and Zach. It's, a, it's an honor. So um, at, at Cisco, we've been looking at, you know, sort of the impacts of, of IoT and all of these devices connecting to all these other devices. And um, to the point that Zach was making some of the security aspects around this, um, you know, we look at drones and, and some examples and mapping out terrains and waterways and looking at, um, you, know, pot, you know, sort of the pollution in the air and some of the other issues around, um, you know, things in the environment that the drones are great at, at detecting. To connect those drones back in, you need architecture and you need designs that allow you to communicate and connect these um, devices together. And so we joined a, a consortium called OpenFog. Um, and, and Open Fog is trying to sort of look at how do you take IoT and the networking and the security and the and the concerns around device to device communications and how do you address some of the architecture and some of the governance around those, um, which then leads to you know another area that Cisco is really involved in and investing in is, is cloud. How do we look at at these edge nodes and these cloud environments, both public clouds and you know sort of IoT type of clouds. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, when you kind of put all that together, what, what I've been looking at a lot lately in my job is what I've been calling the Internet of Dynamic Things, or IODT. And, and this is this, um, this concept of, of trust and governance around, you know, we just today accept a, a smartphone talking to some endpoint app, that that endpoint app is really a good actor and is really doing what we expect that app to do. And, and these devices have the same issues in, in some of these manufacturing plants, some of the, the, um, the fields that we work in with our drones, you just sort of expect that you're getting real data, that it's valid. And there's nothing, you know, man in the middle attacks are pretty easy when you're talking about open air communications. And so trying to figure out how do we secure these dynamic things? How do we allow these, these devices to communicate securely is a really big part of what we have to work on in the future for IoT. Yeah, it, it's a major concern. Obviously, at well, we focus on our cyber secure cloud platform. So we um, really address that cyber security layer too with you. You know, these these organizations, much like your your own Zach and Dawn and others that are out there, you're you're collecting a massive amount of data, which is feeding incredible analytics, giving us the ability to do all that you're doing right now and know how to dial that that information in and we're dealing with lots of environmental variables right in every direction and I think that's the value that the data brings it identifies for us all values so that we can actually bring an even keel or a measurement that we want to be consistent within that space um, and and the security of that data is ever more important today than it is anywhere else and and for for me you know my biggest message out to the CEO level is don't wait you can start implementing security plans now, especially around the cybersecurity layer, as easily as moving into a cybersecure cloud platform like mine, or by bringing in your own layers, um, which obviously have pop pros and cons to both sides of it. So with that said, Dawn, you know, environmental variables, I mean, space for goodness sake, what, what, what larger place could have more inconsistencies, especially from Earth to Mars? How are you guys kind of dealing with that? What are you, can, you, can you kind of explain what you're running into there a little? Well, right now, one of our biggest challenges is the latency between mm -hmm. Earth and Mars. Um, there's so much research that goes into an endeavor this big. Mm -hmm. The latency between Earth and Ma Mars is the reason why we want to embed cognitive neural networks into the machinery so that something out there can self-heal without human interaction. Um, it could take 24 minutes to communicate back and forth. So we're trying to solve that problem with machine learning. Um, but that's just one practical application. There are so many other companies out there that are doing things um, with outer space. And um, again, the innovations that come out of having a stretch goal, like manufacturing on Mars or even manufacturing on the International Space Station, Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that'll give you really um, great technological innovations that ha will have practical applications here on Earth well before yeah. we even get there. So that's why it's it's a great endeavor to really, really reach literally for the stars <laughs> or the planets because the innovations that'll come out of something like that will be able to solve some problems really early on here. Awesome. 
Awesome. Um, I'm kind of reversing the order of, of uh, interview just in case you guys didn't catch that. So Ken, I'll pop back to you. And then obviously, Zach, yeah. finally, you know, I'll come back to you in the, in the end stretch here. But Ken, you know, um, with the world of IoT, right? So, so I, I baked my turkey uh, this weekend with my IoT device that, that monitored its temperatures. So I went to the store and I knew it was still good. And, you know, I installed lights. Literally, the light bulb itself carries IoT. And I'm personally monitoring the watering systems and other pieces of my greenhouses. IoT is exploding. I, I have 50, 60 different objects in the house that are IoT today. What, what is important for, from you to, to CEOs, to the, ex the executive levels of these companies? What part of IoT is not being adopted today? What, what, or how do you discern um, what is not really being successful in that space? Is that, is that a, or should I go with that question differently for you? No, no, I, I, think, I think I get what you're asking, uh, Mike. So I, I think the, the two, two areas that I talk with CEOs the most about are security. Mm -hmm. So the the trust aspect, the you know the privacy concerns that they need to be aware of, and they need to work with their employees on, um, I think is is probably still number one, and and the top top discussion we have with CEOs. Um, I think the second one, even though you know I don't have my Star Trek theme on for Don, I think you know looking at at how we we take advantage of some of the new technologies that are going to be coming out, um, driven by by companies like Don's and driven by you know things that we do in the research communities and and a big part of of a, of a of a any sort of a technology like IoT is going to be the academic um, efforts that are underway, right? So a lot of the universities are doing interesting research in this space, and so. It, to, in general, CEOs and their, their employees have a difficult time understanding what trends are going to be important, what, what aspects of research they should care about. And so I would think, you know, in my opinion, taking a look at the security aspects first and then how do you take some of these new technologies and adopt them mm -hmm. um, is the second thing. And with that comes two, two smaller components of, of kind of an open fog architecture, if you will, that we've been working on. One is the programmability. Um, as, as you kind of mentioned, without programmability, I think Don mentioned, right, if you don't have the ability to sort of manage and monitor this informa information and make corrective actions in real time, by the time you identify something smells bad or something has gone wrong, it's too late, right? You have to sort of be able to pick these things up before you get to that point of a, of a human involvement because otherwise it's too late in most cases. And the, the last piece then is the sort of the scalability of a solution. So. Um, too many times I think enterprises take this idea of a new technology and they put it in a very small little package and they say let's take this little piece of the technology and deploy this and then it just sits there until it's you know out of date in two or three years right and so yeah. being able to sort of deploy the solutions that are coming back in from from academics and from these open communities into your enterprise and then put it in a, in a manner of continuously integrating and continuously deploying and updating that environment to keep it real and to keep it active and to keep it updated. Um, that has to go into the first day's day plan for the CEOs, I believe. Awesome. Awesome. I think, you know, it, it brings me directly into the question for Zach, right? So, you know, Zach, obviously there's, there's issue with, as you roll something out, as you want to test something new, um, you might be building a, a, a prototype, a sensor, a device that doesn't necessarily have communication to a larger size platform or the need for a cloud because it's individually connected at this moment. But as you grow into a grander scale, those needs and those domain demands kind of change, right? So as you move towards the enterprise version of what your product stacks are um, or the different other potential markets that are out there, um, you know, generally a, a, a product that comes out has a tough time finding the natural progression of where it should go within the marketplace. I think you guys have found a very natural progression with that. The concept of scale that Ken was just talking about a moment, a moment ago, that is really your next step. And although you've, you've chosen a cloud platform that's cyber secure, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think there are other things like how do you communicate with, or over a secure Bluetooth or over another protocol that's available. Um, with that statement, right, with that, with that, with that, what are your thoughts on that scale? What are your thoughts on the need for that scale um, or the need for that, that hierarchy of communication and aggregation of data? Well, I mean, one of our biggest concerns is like the, the, the reliability of the network because 
like I was mentioned earlier, we're going to just from our launch, we're going to put a system in 50 different countries. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, like there's big carriers that allow us to have a strong network, but we don't we don't know really what to expect because some of those uh, customers may be in rural areas. So that's number one. So connectivity you know, as we scale the platform from just the Nebo one to uh, a larger size system or even enterprise. You know, we have people that are uploading information from all over. And so, like, for us, like, the reliability is in my, our biggest concern. Security is definitely a concern, but I don't know if people are going to be hacking in someone's cherry tomatoes and want to, like, you know, ruin their harvest. <laughs> um, I think that's definitely something we need to think about if we are, like, enterprise. Right? So if we're on an enterprise level, uh, I feel security would be something that will come into a more a higher priority. Uh, because they, they may have a lot more money at stake. And, you know, when there's more money at stake, there's more opportunity for, you know, situations to uh, come about that are negative. And so, like, for us, the platform of reliability is my biggest concern. And number two is how do we, how do we organize all the information that we give it back to the community, right? So, like, if you're uploading a rapini from Italy or something from, you know, I don't know, you, you know, Ukraine or something, uh, we got to make sure that that's, like, streamlined, uh, it's simple, and it's, and it's obviously fast because people want, you know, they want it to be quick. They want it to be convenient. So reliability is still, at the end of the day, like the number one factor that we have to think about as we scale out. Yeah. Uh, security, I feel, will be maybe further down the road. Uh, so that's, that's what we think about, and that's what we do a lot of our testing on that are outside of plants is we test the reliability. I mean, I can copy turn on a light with the system in Spain now, but what if we have like 250,000 people on the network, half a million? So that's, so that's a different uh, it's a different level absolutely understood and, and as as one of the folks who uh who work with you diligently and on the side i gotta say security's got to be a top priority but this is a common theme this is a very common theme across uh, an organization who's on that ramp up right you don't have the security expertise what you have is the expertise around agriculture what you have is the expertise around technologies you guys have an amazing platform you have an amazing development team um, the reality is this is the for, this is the, the shortfall that a lot of organizations come to. Um, but my statement oh, my statement to you is, and this is to everyone out there, um, realistically, it can be put into place rapidly by choosing that platform, which is the reason you made the choices that you did with us. But you know that that is a you, you need to implement right away. You need to start that focus right away. Your comfort is where you do your things well, right? But a security person needs to be a part of that total picture. For a lot of those other organizations, you're right now, again, nobody's going to be hacking into others' tomatoes, but you are not limiting anyone to the crop that they can grow with your technology. And so you never know where that ends up going. And so, again, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't advocate for people to take pictures of certain areas because it's not a positive advocation, right? If you're building an app that wants to take pictures of something, you know? Um, so with that, though, let's shift into a conversation real quick with Ken and on that security boundary, um, Ken, blockchain. I mean, I, I've got to bring it to the to the forefront here, right? The reality is, is every major bank that I'm dealing with um, are utilizing and starting to implement blockchain uh, implementations. Uh, it is a community-based transactional model that allows us to have a true chain of custody. The CEOs that are going to be keying into this, um, how important really is that blockchain uh, and, and environmental policy and disruption uh, from your perspective, from a Cisco perspective? Well, definitely from, from a Cisco perspective and, and working with large financial institutions and with some of the Fortune 500, we definitely see a, a huge interest in blockchain. We were doing quite a few um, proof of concepts and, and co-development efforts with our customers in the space. Um, and there's, there's three areas that I, I kind of like to talk about with blockchain so that CEOs sort of understand why they should care, right? The first one is just the breach proof of that communication channels that, that are being opened up in, in each of these different sorts of uh, financial trades or, um, you know, personal information is being exchanged across different transactions that are happening in the larger enterprises. So um, it, it definitely has an impact in, in, in helping to secure that communication line. There's also something we've been working on, um, and, and it's a Linux Foundation project called um, Hyperledger. And so we feel like creating a distributed um, ledger database technology that will help you not only enforce the trust that you're putting in place with these devices, but also hyper um, blockchain gives you the ability to have the accountability and the auditability, which as, as everyone on this call understands without 
audit accountability and auditability, you don't really have a strong technology solution. And so for those for those three areas, communication, um, trust, accountability, and auditability, those are sort of the, the top things I mentioned to CEOs. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, 100 percent realistically, uh, you know, compliance is number one for, for well, we're, we're PCI compliant. We ISO, we, we have a HIPAA audit. We stand on a regular basis with our third party auditors. That security value, that that policy driven layer is so imperative in order to be able to really continue from a, a again, from a sustainability perspective, in order for me to sustain my technology, which is helping us sustain as as human beings um but you know i keep get caught on the fact that that's so far a policy writing a policy is only after you understand the actions the roles and responsibilities and the steps that get you there for dawn i mean you know you guys are starting in an environment where you don't even really know what variables you're going to be working against what, you know, what sort of materials, I mean, you, have, you guys are starting at the beginning again, right? You're even starting with the discussion around materials and what materials to be used up in Mars. Um, how is technology helping you in, in, in that space? How is, how is that cognitive side helping you? Well, thank you. thankfully, we are uh, working with so much, just decades and decades of research. Um, at least we've achieved enough to understand what the environment is. Um, we understand what kind of materials would be possible in a place like that. So that's where we're starting. We're starting with the existing research, and then we're innovating the existing tools. I mean, right now, we went from 3D printers that were just printing um, carbon, and now they're, they're printing with titanium. So that's the kind of thing that we're doing. But um, I actually want to go back to build on what... Ken is saying, uh, Good, thank I you. really love, yeah, no, I really love the idea of blockchain. I don't want it to get lost on any of the CEOs out there that right now we're in the sharing community. And Cisco, I, I bow down to Cisco for, I think, leading the charge so long ago uh, in open source and allowing the community to always innovate. I think that it really inures to our benefit to really democratize technology. And then to go back with what Zachary was saying, what he wants to do with, he wants to do exactly that through agriculture. And we've got people that are working with satellite telephony um, and, and launching low orbital satellites into outer space uh, so that they can just pick up pings from sticker sensors all over the world. And, you know, there's a company that I really admire, Helios Wire. Um, they're innovating, they're building these satellites, and they're on track to be able to track five, up to five billion devices in the future that with their satellites, they're launching every, I think, 18 months, um, tracking these, getting sensor technology and getting the information to the entire world, to these rural communities that can't even access the internet right now. It's going to cost him a cost us a dollar a month for that sort of data, and he's doing it already. Um, he's working with Nigeria right now. He's working with um, Asia. So it's really incredible um, to know that there are companies out there that are into extreme connectivity and want to really democratize this technology. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing, Don. It really is. Um, you know, I, I think the bottom line and really the key to the message uh, for a lot of the CEOs that are keying in for us today, um, you know, it's really about shifting into action, right? It's got to be about shifting into action. And you all are so successful at that. You've taken ideas that most would have you know, Walt Disney was scoffed at it a lot in the very, very beginning, right? So it's been a very short amount of time that someone would have been scoffed at for their ability to just dream and think big. How do you guys shift into action? Um, I guess let's start just at the top. Zach, we'll go from Zach to Ken and back down to Don. Don, if you don't mind being the tail end of that. Um, but can you guys just give a, a shift to action, um, whether it's really a plug back to your own organization or not, but how do our CEOs start taking that next step um, without it being a huge cost to them? That's, good. That's a great question. Uh, 
I, I was just actually talking to my partner in the Urban River just the other day because you know we've been at it four years, me two years, and now finally putting something in the water. And I know it has nothing to do with NIWA or IoT, mm. but it's like there's enough. Well, I, there's two answers. One, there's enough resources that can be distributed that we all can benefit from. Number one, and number two is that in the areas that you know Don was saying, like rural areas, that you know just the fact that they can use their phone to like pay for their bus and their banking. Is like a simple thing for us that we take for granted that like is monumental for them. They're not looking to use AI. They're not using to have driverless cars or uh, self-driving cars. They just want to have the ability to like pay for stuff in their everyday life, in like in, in a world that's in the 21st century. So, you know, taking action is is about technology that you're working on that's kind of bigger than yourself, bigger than the company, and that's kind of why the two projects I'm involved in. I mean, it's just me personally is that it's not about urban rivers or Niwa. It's about giving people the ability to grow food and improving the rivers, but using technology that it impacts not me, but generations after. So the action, I feel like, is more of like a necessity because it's, it's not about just us. And it's not just about our generation. And I, and I know it kind of came from two different angles, but that's just like my kind of my gut reaction to that question. Take action where there's necessity. I mean, absolutely. I, I absolutely love it. Ken? It just just to add to that, I think there, there are two things I would add or actions for the CEOs. One is um, realize that that IoT isn't just a fad. It is it is sort of transforming all of our industries. It's not just a local uh, phenomenon. It's going to be a global uh, marketplace as well. And so um, get involved, uh, educate yourself now, educate your company today. Um, I wouldn't wait um, at all. And then. If you're looking for resources, uh, you know, Cisco has tons of resources in this space. We're willing to, to partner and help you in any way we can. And then in open source communities, there's open fog and there's, you know, hyperledger. So it, it's a lot of open community opportunities to get involved. And then um, Cisco and other large companies are happy to help and, and help drive and, and educate what we can. Excellent. Dawn? Um, and I'd like to say with the CEOs, we meet so many at the Cognitive Consortium uh, that just don't even know where to begin um, because they're so tied up in the wearables. <laughs> I think that's the way that everyone's understood IoT. So they're tied up in trying to understand how do I innovate when I'm just, uh, you know, a, a chain restaurant or something like that. So. I just sit there and think of ways that I can get them to stop worrying about missing out and mm -hmm. start really dreaming big because the great thing about this technology is they can go for their pipe dreams and their pie in the sky ideas. And it's so inexpensive. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I guess I, I'm probably going to really touch a nerve with Zach and uh, Ken and I know you, Mike. Um, with this one right here, how many DevOps professionals are sitting in a country, I mean, in a company collecting dust because their companies don't realize how valuable they can be if they just hand it over a sandbox yeah. in a Cisco environment or a wall environment or something like that, where they can play and tinker and innovate without breaking anything. So let so, them play, let them play and let them grow. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Awesome. No, that's, that's absolutely outstanding. You know, I think, and then just as a, as a final end all, um, as a final end all key value to this, you guys, I, uh, I again, personally want to say thank you for all the efforts you folks are putting in on a regular basis and in really helping the sustainability that's happening out there for, for my kids and then my children's children. Cause that's really what it, for me, it's about the community. It's about the people around me. Um, with that, can each one of you let me know, you know, for our viewers that are out there, wh where are you going to be next? Where can we see you? Is there a place where we can catch up with you? A show? Is there a, a lecture that we're going to be? Where can I catch you next? Well, I mean, you could, uh, we, we, for us on Niwa and, and Urban Rivers, we're heavily integrated in social media. Uh, there's no like upcoming speaking events. Those happen more impromptu, but always reach out to us, you know, at Niwa, at Get Niwa or at Urban Riv. Uh, we are always here to talk to people that want to do something uh, that has to do with the environmental technology because that's what we focus on. Brilliant. Ken? I'll be at the um, Open Source Leadership Summit in Lake Tahoe in February and then Cisco Live in Berlin. So you can always reach me there or at uh, Ken Owens 12 on Twitter. Brilliant. Don? Uh, 
I can't say that I have any upcoming um, projects right now that are confirmed. Um, so I would just reach out to us on, uh, you can actually direct message us uh, through Twitter or reach us at the Cognitive Consortium uh, website, cognitiveconsortium.com. Um, and I'll keep all of our upcoming events advertised on that. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah, we have a number of blogs that are launching over at woe.com. And uh, we have a, a whole multitude of different uh, announcements. PR, PR Newswire has a big piece out on us and so forth. So um, you guys, I look forward to the next one of doing this. I so appreciate your time. Dean, thank you to you and to your organization for being such awesome hosts. We really, really, truly appreciate it. And back to you, my friend. Thank you very much, Michael. And same to you, panelists. Thank you very much for being here. I feel like we have only just begun to dip our toes into this subject matter. So let's do this again real soon. Um, if you want to see, see this and other monthly virtual roundtables on demand, plus the calendar for upcoming roundtables, both virtually and at te the Telecom Exchange, check out jamiescotto.com. That's J-A-Y-M-I-E-S-C-O-T-T-O dot com. And for the Telecom Exchange, that is the Telecom Exchange. Dot com. Thanks everyone for tuning in to JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom. Thanks again. We'll see you soon.